Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Tear the place apart to begin with. Can everybody hear? Is this working all right? Are you packing? Turn it off. <laughs> I don't know what this is here, but it looks a little suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> Too many gadgets make you question things, you know? <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here tonight at this fantastic independent bookstore, and you guys look a little crowded back there. I feel like I got some breathing room up here, but um, it's nice that we could squeeze everybody in. It reminds me, uh, uh, a, a month or so ago, I was in Ecuador uh, speaking there, and we had a theater that um, got overloaded. There were a couple of thousand people outside pounding to get in, and everybody had taken the seats. And finally, the management decided to let everybody else in, so they'd have to sit on the floor, and people would have to crowd up together, and people were sitting under the, the bleachers, etc. And I was so taken by the response of the Ecuadorian people, because rather than saying, oh no, we've got our seats, don't let anyone else in. They all pushed together even more and they let people sit on their laps and they all applauded when the management announced they were going to let these people in who were banging on the doors. So it's nice to be cozy sometimes and share community. Last time I was here, I was uh, talking about Confessions of an Economic Hitman because secret history hadn't been written at that point. And that really focused on my own job as an economic hitman and what economic hitmen do and how we've created the world's first truly global empire primarily without the military primarily through economics and it was that book was really my confession and I had no idea whether anyone would ever read it or not um, I'd been to 9-11 I'd been up to ground zero shortly after 9-11 and decided that I had to tell this story but I really didn't know whether anybody would write it and in fact that book was rejected by 29 publishers <laughs> so after it came out um, a lot of other economic hitmen jackals assassins government officials Peace Corps volunteers corporate executives came to me and told me their stories and a lot of their stories they told me they had to keep secret because they were still in the business they had to protect themselves but their stories were fascinating. In fact, some of them made my stories, I thought, look very innocent and naive, some of the things these people had done. And at the same time, as I came around to groups like this one, and, and in fact here, uh, a year or so ago, one of the questions that kept coming up was, what can we do? How can we change this world? How can we create a more sustainable, stable, and peaceful world for our children and for children all over the planet? And so the secret history of the American empire grew out of those two things, people coming up with their stories, other people. It has my stories too, more of my stories, but mainly other people's stories and brings it up to date to, to 2007, what's going on in Latin America today, what's going on in the Middle East and in Africa. But perhaps to me the most important part of this book is the hope, because as I wrote this book more and more and looked into what we can do to change things and talked to people and traveled around the country and met with university students, groups like you, I became increasingly convinced that we are on the verge of turning things around. That it is time that we must do this. We must do something that's never been done in history before. We know from history that empires never continue. They always collapse. And we're challenged to do something that's never been done by before, because when, his, when empires collapse, a vacuum is created. And then there are wars, and a new empire emerges. We don't want that to happen. What we need to do is change this empire, to transform it into a model that can serve our children and our grandchildren. And we have to understand I have to understand, for example, I'm about, to ha I'm about to become a grandfather for the first time. Thank you. <laughs> it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity and a great gift. On the other hand, it's very frightening because I know that my grandchild is coming into a very challenging world and I don't think there's anybody out here that would disagree with me that we're facing very challenging times. We've got climate change. We've got terrorism around the world. 
We live in a country where less than 5% of the world's population consume more than 25% of the world's resources and create more than, more than 30% of the world's pollution. And so we know that that's not a model that can continue. We can't sell this model to the Chinese who have more than 20% of the world's population or the Indians with about 17%. We must change. And so uh, this book, Secret History, is really devoted to that. And that's what I would like to spend some time talking with you about tonight. But before I do, I, 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 it's probably some of you are asking, well, what is an economic hitman? And what did you do as one? How did you become one? And so I'll talk a little bit about that before moving on to the prospects of where I think we should go for here. But as I, as I speak tonight, I would ask each of you to hold in your hearts the idea that we're going to leave here tonight, all of us, every one of us together is going to leave here tonight committed to changing this world, to creating a sustainable, peaceful, and stable world for every child everywhere because our grandchildren cannot inherit such a world unless every child born in Asia, Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, and everywhere else also has that expectation. We here cannot have homeland security until we recognize that the entire planet is our homeland. We are a small community. And so the intent tonight <laughs> and so my reason for being here tonight, the bookstore thinks it's to sell books and my publisher thinks it's to sell books. <laughs> but I don't really care about selling books. <laughs> I want you to read the books. But, but most important of all is that my intent for being here tonight, and I hope it will be your intent when you leave, is that we're all going to come together to create a sustainable, sustainable stable and peaceful world for every child everywhere on this planet, for all of us and for all of our children and grandchildren. So what is an economic hitman? How did I become one? Um, let me start with the second question. I was uh, in college still in business school in Boston and uh, I was trying to avoid the draft. I didn't want to go to Vietnam. And uh, to make a long story short, I got recruited by the National Security Agency, the nation's largest and perhaps most secretive spy organization. They put me through a series of lie detector tests and personality tests, and they basically concluded a couple of things. One, that I would make a good economic hitman. <laughs> and two, that um, I had some character flaws, if you want to call them that, that would make it easy to be seduced into being an economic hitman, that could be used as hooks to draw me in. And I think it's fair to summarize that by saying my flaws were perhaps the three big drugs of our culture, um, if you want to call them that, power, money, and sex. So who out there hasn't had at least one of those addictions in your life? <laughs> as a young man, <laughs> That's that generation we're doing all this for. <laughs> How old is he? Four. Four, all right. <laughs> nice to have you here. We got, we got people as old as me here and as young as four. That's fantastic. Anybody younger than four here? <laughs> <laughs> so um, in any case, I, I eventually I ended up actually after being recruited and accepting a job with the NSA, I ended up going into the Peace Corps. Um, that, again, that's explained in the book, but uh, to cut through that, the Peace Corps sent me to a training camp in Southern California, a nudist colony. <laughs> that's the sex part. <laughs> Yeah, that's the sex part. Well, you know, actually, if you're going to be sent into the Amazon, and I'd ask for the Amazon, um, a nudist colony isn't a bad place to get your training. <laughs> but for eight weeks, uh, the Peace Corps taught me Spanish and about credit and savings co-ops. I would graduated from business school, so they decided that I should be a credit and savings co-op specialist. And I think there's probably quite a few 
uh, bilingual people in this room tonight, and uh, you certainly know that eight weeks isn't very sufficient for learning a, a foreign language. But after eight weeks, the Peace Corps sent me to Ecuador, and um, I took a bus from the high up in the Andes for about two days, up over the mountains, down into the jungle. This is a bus that was filled with pigs and chickens and goats <laughs> and people of all ages, and every buddy and every animal on that bus was vomiting all the way over the Andes and for two days. So it was a very good experience. And at the end of the road, I start walking into the jungle for another couple of days. And as I'm walking into the jungle, I'm experimenting with my lousy Spanish, with people coming out of the jungle. And to my distress, I discovered that my lousy Spanish was a lot better than theirs because I was going into schwa territory. The schwa don't speak Spanish. Oh. They speak schwa. <laughs> so be it for the Peace Corps. Yeah, one of my first experiences with American bureaucracy, I was being sent in to speak Spanish to people that don't speak Spanish. <laughs> You're beginning to loosen up a little bit now, huh? It's good. Um, when I got into the village where I was supposed to spend the next two years, there was one man there who spoke, very, who spoke Spanish fluently, the school teacher, and so I patiently explained to him in my lousy Spanish that I'd come here to help this community form credit and savings co-ops. <laughs> <laughs> and he kind of looks around <laughs> and he says, you know, everything here is barter. We don't have any money in this community. A after all, actually, currency dissolves pretty fast in the rainforest. He says, you know, it's my guinea pigs for your papayas. <laughs> so, um, it was a very interesting experience, but what I learned very quickly is that my vaunted education in the United States had nothing to offer to these people. On the other hand, they had a great deal to teach me about many things. And rather than just staying for two years in the Peace Corps, I extended for a third year, which is the longest you can do in the Peace Corps. And it was a remarkable experience. What I didn't know at the time, however, was that I was really being prepped to be an economic hitman. Because these very people now in the Ecuadorian Amazon, beginning back then and t up to today, are waging a major battle against the, the big corporations, the international corporations, especially the oil companies. Huge battle. In fact, there's a major lawsuit right now, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. Uh, and so I was being prepped for that. And while I was there, another economic hitman, uh, vice president of the company, came down and recruited me to go to work for that company. I was trained by a woman named Claudine, a remarkable, intelligent, stunning, very cunning and seductive woman. She knew all about my past. She had all of my files to the NSA, and she used everything she had learned to hook me, to bring me in, all those three drugs to bring me in. <laughs> and she explained to me what an economic hitman was meant to do. And essentially, economic hitmen have built the world's first truly global empire in this, the last few decades, since World War II, and especially in the last several decades. And we've done it primarily without the military, through economics. So it's been done secretly. Most people in the United States have no idea that this opulence that we live with is built on the backs of serfdom, of slavery, of exploitation. And Claudine told me these things, and she said, you know, you work many ways, but the most common way that you will work is to identify a third world country that has resources our corporations covet, like oil, and arrange a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. However, the money won't go to the country. Instead, it will go to our corporations to build big infrastructure projects in that country, like power plants and industrial parks and ports projects that will benefit a few very wealthy people in that country, as well as our corporations, but won't help most of the people at all because they don't, they're not connected to the power grids or they use very little electricity. They don't have the skills to get jobs in industrial parks. They don't use ports or highways. But the country will be left holding a huge debt, so huge that it can't possibly repay it, which is part of the intent. So at some point, we economic hitmen will go back to the country and say, listen, you can't pay your debts. You owe us a pound of flesh. 
sell your oil real cheap to our oil companies, or vote with us on the next critical United Nations vote, or send troops in support of ours to someplace in the world like Iraq. And in that way, we've created this empire. On the few occasions when economic hitmen fail, as I failed in Panama with Omar Torrijos and in Ecuador with Jaime Roldos, on those few occasions when we fail, the jackals step in. And jackals are men and sometimes women who overthrow governments or assassinate their leaders. So when I failed with Omar Torrijos in Panama, when I was unable to bring him around, and with Jaime Roldos in Ecuador, unable to corrupt him, both of these men were assassinated by our jackals. They died in fiery airplane crashes, but there's no question that these were CIA-supported assassinations. On the few occasions when neither the economic hitmen nor the jackals are successful, then and only then does the military step in. And that's what's happened in Iraq. And I'm not going to go into the details now. It's, it's in the books, and we may, might come up in the questions and answers. But I talked about the last time I was here, what has happened in, in Iraq. But we've managed to create this empire in this way. First, the economic hitmen, who usually are successful. If not, then the jackals. And if they fail, as a last resort, the military. Um, I just returned from Latin America. In fact, I spent New Year's Eve with, with, in the presidential palace in, in La Paz with Evo Morales. And since then, I've been to Ecuador and with the new president there, uh, Rafael Correa, and, and into Nicaragua with Ortega and Costa Rica and another number of other countries, all this in this year, uh, 2007. And it's been fascinating to me to watch what's going on in Latin America. I think it's an amazing case in point. And I know there's quite a few people in this room who, who, who identify with Latin America, who have relatives there. And I just want to say that I think Latin America gives us tremendous hope because in the last, pre in the last presidential elections, democratic elections, eight countries, seven in South America, one in Central America, representing more than 80% of the population of South America, 300 million people out of 360 million have voted in the president who said no more exploitation by foreign corporations. These are not anti-American presidents. I've met with them. Every one of them quotes our Declaration of Independence. Every one of them believes in our principles of freedom, of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all people, and of equality and justice for all. And they open us with open arms. They welcome us with open arms. These are not anti-American presidents, despite what our press may say. These are people who are saying things like, Ecuador's oil ought to help Ecuador's people. We need to take more b profits from Bolivia's gas to help Bolivia's poor people pull themselves up by their, their, by their bootstraps. That's what's going on. And in almost every one of these countries, I've been working in these countries since 1968 when I was a Peace Corps volunteer and then as an economic hitman. I've been going back time and time again. I have godchildren in these countries. And it's been amazing to me because when I was first there in the 60s and in the 70s, almost every one of these countries was run by a pu puppet dictator, a puppet of the United States. And the people were very put down and the resources were plundered by our corporations. And yet, in the last few years, 80% of the continent of South America has elected a president who stood up and said, no more of that. We want to use our resources for our people. It's an amazing thing that's happened. And in order for it to happen, it's required that people from all diversities and sides of life have had to come together. Indigenous people, landowners, uh, commercial people, bankers, many, many different people have come together. And of course, there are those that dissent. There are many who do not like some of these governments, but you'll always find that in a democracy, and that's what makes a democracy great, when you can have dissent. But the fact of the matter is, there's an amazing movement south of the border here that's lighting a light, I think, that shows us that change can happen. And it can happen very quickly, and it can happen peacefully, because those changes have happened peacefully, for the most part. So how do we go about changing our own system here? How do we go about 
changing the role that economic hitmen have played, how do we go about creating a sustainable, stable, and peaceful world? How do you and I do that? And what is the trigger in each one of us that would make us want to do that? That would, make, that would compel us to think that we need to make such a change? Um, well, first I'd like to share with you a, a cartoon. We'll, we'll, we'll get out of the seriousness here for just a minute, which <laughs> I think this cartoon, I, I ran across it the other day, I think it kind of summarizes where we're coming from today before we look at where we move on. This is a cartoon of humanized sheep, you know, sheep on two legs, and they're at a cocktail party. And the first sheep says, well, do you think we ought to sit down or stay standing? And the second sheep says, should we have something to drink? And the third sheep says, do you think we can dance or should we just stay here? And the fourth sheep points to the doorway and there's a dog standing in the doorway and he says, oh, thank God the border collie has finally arrived <laughs> to show us what to do. And I'm afraid that for too long we've been listening to the border collie. We've all been looking to the border collie to tell us whether we should stand up or sit down or what we should drink or where we should go, what we should do. And so now it's truly time to turn that around. But what is it that triggers this in each of us? And I, again, I'd like to tell a personal story of, of what turned me off from being an economic hitman. I had done this for 10 years and I would struggled with my conscience throughout those 10 years and yet I was constantly told that what I was doing was the right thing, a good thing. I was patted on the back by Robert McNamara, president of the World Bank. I was asked to lecture at Harvard and other prestigious universities. But in my heart I knew that what I was doing was wrong. And then uh, one day I was on vacation sailing in a small sailboat in the Virgin Islands. I anchored my boat off uh, St. John Island and climbed up this mountain on the island to an old sugarcane plantation, the ruins of a plantation. It was overgrown with bougainvillea and the sun was setting over the Caribbean. It was very, very beautiful. And as I sat there taking in this beauty, I was suddenly struck by the fact that this sugarcane plantation had been built on the bones of thousands of slaves. And then I realized that this whole hemisphere has been built on the bones of millions of slaves. And then it struck me that I too was a slaver, that my job around the world was enslaving people in order to supply us with these resources and I also realized that in a way all of us in our society are living off slavery. We're living off the fruits of that exploitation. And so I made the decision then and there that I would no longer be an economic hitman. And I came home several days later to Boston where my headquarters were and resigned. And for the next years I several times attempted to write the book about what I had done. But each time I started to write the book, I approached other people who had been economic hitmen or jackals, the assassins, to get their stories. And each time then, I was approached by people who threatened me and bribed me. And I succumbed to the threats and the bribes. It took some money, a lot of money sometimes. And I have to say, I put most of that money toward nonprofits like Dream Change. You can go to dreamchange.org or pachamama.org. So I kind of assuaged my guilt working with indigenous people, especially in, in South America. But I wasn't telling the story. And then 9-11 on, then happened many years later. And on 9-11, I was in the Amazon. I was back with the Schwa people. I'd taken a group in to learn from the Schwa. But shortly after 9-11, I came up to ground zero. And as I stood there at that smoldering pit, looking down into it, I knew that I had to tell the story. I knew that people in the United States had to come to understand why there's so much frustration, anger, even hatred aimed at us. And this is in no way to condone the mass violence that occurred at Ground Zero, but it is to say that I realized that I had a responsibility to speak out, to tell this story. And this time I decided that I wouldn't tell anybody I was writing it. I wouldn't contact any of these other people uh, as I had done before. Even my 
my wife, who's here with us someplace tonight, <laughs> I can't find her anymore. Uh, <laughs> there she is, way back there. Hi. Even my wife and daughter, who was about to give me a, a, a grandson, didn't know what I was doing. They knew I was writing something, but they didn't know what. And, and it, nobody was, knew what I was doing until the manuscript was in the hands of my agent, and he'd sent it out to a lot of publishers. And at that point, the book becomes my best insurance policy because any self-respecting jackal knows that if something dire happens to me, um, the book sales are going to soar even a lot more than they already <laughs> have. <laughs> I, was, I was telling this similar story in a bookstore in New York City a, a few weeks ago, and I just introduced a number of my publishers, Penguin people, my editor and some of the other people earlier. And uh, after I told this story, somebody raised their hand and they said, Aren't you afraid that your publisher is going to have you assassinated? <laughs> <laughs> Book sales. So um, I had these two incredible moments of epiphany, one at the Virgin Islands and one at Ground Zero. And I think all of us go through times like that. You can think about your own times. When have you been struck by the injustices of, in the world and by your own equivocation in your life? You know. We all have things that we do that we know we use a little too much petroleum, we buy uh, sweatshop made clothes, we do this, we do that. So when do you think about these things and what drives you then to move to change? And once you're driven to move to change, how do we change this culture? How do we change the society? How do we create a sustainable, stable and peaceful world? How do we move away from the collie dog in the doorway? And I think the first important question to ask in response to that question is, who's the emperor? Because an empire needs an emperor. And I imagine that there may be, I'm sure most of this audience is Republican, but the, <laughs> well, well, I grew up a very conservative New England Republican. So I thought I was amongst friends here. <laughs> uh, but if there's a few Democrats out there, you may think you know who the emperor is, but you're wrong, you know? An emperor is not elected, does not serve a limited term, and basically answers to no one. And we don't have a single person like that, but we do have the equivalent, and it's a group I call the corporatocracy, which are the men and maybe a few women who run our biggest corporations. This is not a conspiracy theory, these people don't have to get together and conspire. They all basically went to the same schools or similar schools. They all have the same objective and that is maximizing profits, making windfall profits, making a few rich people a lot richer and they all know what they have to do to keep that going. They're not elected, they don't serve a limited term and they report to no one. They sometimes like to make us think, want us to think that they report to their boards of directors, but they all serve on each other's boards of directors, and basically the boards of directors follow what the CEO wants to do. This is the corporatocracy. The corporatocracy controls our media, either by owning it directly or funding it through advertisements. They control our government in the United States and most other governments. In the United States, they are the ones who fund the campaigns. Every candidate is in some form or another beholden to them. Sh shocking to hear that in the next presidential election, both of the two final candidates, Republican and Democrat each, are going to have to spend a half a billion dollars. How much of that are you donating? <laughs> well, don't. Well, no, it's going to come primarily from the corporations, not directly because they have limitations, but through their primary owners, their big stockholders, their CEOs, their management. They really control the situation. In fact, as I grew up as a kid, I remember, you know, we learned the world was this place with about 180 some odd countries. And a couple of these countries were very powerful and, and controlled a lot of the others, and that was primarily the, the Soviet Union and the United States until detente and then it was us. But today the geopolitics of the world is very different from that. You might better visualize this planet like this and then huge clouds drifting around the planet. And they know no national borders. They respect no national laws. They're not nationalistic in any way. These are the big corporations. 
They control the geopolitics. So if we want to change this world, we must change the power base of the corporatocracy. We must change the corporations. <laughs> Thank you. And I already hear somebody over here asking, how do we do that? Well, that's the next part here. Um, you know, what we really must change is the basic goal of these corporations, because today their primary goal is the bottom line, maximizing profits, making windfall profits, making a few rich people a lot richer. And we must convince them to change their goal to being good citizens, good communities, to creating a sustainable, stable, and peaceful world for all people everywhere, for every child on this planet. We must convince them to be good citizens and to take on this responsibility. And I'm extremely confident that we can do this. We've had amazing success at changing corporations whenever we've, had, we've, whenever we've set our hearts and minds to doing it. So I recall when I was a student in Boston, we couldn't walk beside the Charles River because it was so polluted. And there were rivers in the Middle West of this country, Midwest of this country, that were burning with pollution. Not anymore. We forced the corporations to clean them up. And we were destroy destroying the ozone layer with aerosol cans. Not anymore. We forced corporations to open their doors to minority groups. We forced Detroit against its initial resistance to install seat belts and airbags. Uh, we've gotten major food chains to drop trans fats. Just uh, two weeks ago, the New York Times had a full-page ad from Tyson's, the biggest chicken manufacturer in the country, perhaps the world, uh, an open letter to you, the consumer, saying, more, we'll put antibiotics in our chickens because you, the consumer, have insisted upon it. You've let us know. We have tremendous power, you and I, to change these corporations, to bring them around. We have incredible power to do that. They depend on us to buy everything they produce, and they depend upon us as their laborers, their workers also. And so we can bring this thing around, we can change them. And another reason we can change them is because at the head of every one of those corporations, and all the way up that pyramid, there are men and women like you and me. They have children and grandchildren. They don't want to see Florida underwater. <laughs> they don't want to see the ozone layer destroyed. They don't want climate warming. They don't want to see the rainforest destroyed. They don't want terrorism. They don't want to create a world that their children can't survive in. And we need to bring them around. Uh, and uh, I think a, a, a little story is, is, is pertinent to this right now. How many people here know of Rainforest Action Network? Great, we need a few more, I think, but um, an amazing organization that, an amazing organization that's changed the policies of some of the, some of the world's biggest and worst offenders of cutting rainforests and old growth trees. Rainforest Action Network has changed Boise Cascade, City Corp, Mitsubishi, McDonald's, uh, Office Home Depot, Kinko's. Tremendous organizations, they've never lost a battle, and they've done most of this with a staff of about 20 and a budget of $2 million a year. Not a big organization, they just doubled this last year to 40 and 4 million, but they've done most of this with a very small staff and a very small budget. And a few years ago, Mitsubishi was considered the world's worst, worst cutter and logger of rainforest trees. Probably most people don't realize that's a huge organization. And Rainforest Action Network went after them. And at some point, it became quite nasty between Randy Hayes, the founder of Rainforest Action Network, and a senior executive at Mitsubishi. They really locked horns. And eventually, Mitsubishi signed the agreement. RAN won. RAN always wins. So Mitsubishi signed the agreement. And a few months later, this thing is bothering me there. Can you hear me now, too? A few months later, um, I happened to be at a conference in Santa Barbara, California, with about 30 people, a small conference, and both of these gentlemen were there, Randy Hayes and the executive for Mitsubishi. And it was kind of interesting that during this conference, uh, 
during, on Saturday morning, morning, you'd see them, they'd start to sort of maybe move toward each other in the room <coughs> accidentally, and then they would notice that they were getting a little too close, and they'd go shooting out in opposite directions. <laughs> it's kind of like a magnet coming together, those parts that repel. And they'd keep away from each other. And, and on Saturday night, Randy and I decided to take a six pack of beer and go up the hill to the hot tub, which was up there. And there was a full moon that night. And we were going to go up and drink beer in the hot tub and enjoy the full moon and exchange wild stories about the Amazon because Randy thinks his stories can top mine. <laughs> but they can't. <laughs> I'm sure you all agree with that. Uh, but anyway, we headed up there to the hot tub. And when we got there, we discovered that there was another man already in the hot tub. <laughs> The Mitsubishi executive. <laughs> and I'm sure he didn't want to do this, but he didn't have much choice but to say, okay guys, come on in, join the party. So Randy and I stripped down and climbed into the hot tub with him, and I, I've got to admit, I was a little, um, I was a little anxious <laughs> getting into that hot tub naked with these two guys that had been <laughs> arch enemies, drinking beer, watching a full moon. I mean, like, what's gonna happen here tonight? <laughs> But as the evening went on, uh, at some point the Mitsubishi executive raises his beer can and he says, Randy, I have to thank you. He said, you know, I have kids and I have grandchildren and I love rainforests. I want my kids to see the Amazon and the great forests of British Columbia. And a lot of other executives at Mitsubishi feel as I do. We'd wanted to do the right thing, but we didn't dare because we were afraid we would just lose our jobs and be replaced by someone tougher. But when you and your people came after us and you made our stockholders and our executive committee and our board of directors take notice and you forced us to form a committee to see what we had to do to change things, then we could do the right thing. So thank you, Randy Hayes. Thank you, Rainforest Action Network. And I think that story is, is extremely telling in that it's not a single case. It happens all over this country. It's happening here now. You people in the state of Florida just uh, made your biggest utility company, Florida Power and Light, and another utility <coughs> company also, drop the idea of building a coal-fired plant. Mm, this coal... I have to tell a tale. My wife, who's sitting in the back of the room, is manager of environmental department for Florida Power and Light. <laughs> I went uh, and she always opposed that coal plant. And yet, there was tremendous pressures within the corporation to build it. And there were a lot of people in the company that didn't want to see it built. But it took the people of the state to voice their opinion. And when we voice our opinions, then things really happen. Things turn around. We have tremendous power because so many executives, whether it's at Florida <laughs> Power and Light or whether it's wherever it is in whatever corporation, people want to turn things around. People want a better world. But so many of these executives have grown up with the paradigm that they have to maximize profit at all costs, at all social and environmental costs. We must teach them something else. We must teach them that there's something more important. We need to show them that what we, uh, what we want to do, what I want to do, I want to be proud to wear the Nike swoosh <laughs> as a symbol of a company that's creating a sustainable, stable, and peaceful world. I can't do that now. Nike doesn't re represent that at all. We need to change Nike so that we can wear that swoosh proudly and say this is a company that's Main objective is creating a better world for our children. We can do that, and there's a lot of executives out there that want to help us. The important thing is to get corporations to move toward a new goal. So this brings us, it's getting really hot, so I'm gonna bring this to a close pretty, pretty soon. Uh, this brings us to the question of what can you do? What can each of us do? Well, each of us has tremendous power. We have a lot more power than we realize. Every single day when we shop or we speak to our neighbors, we have tremendous power and tremendous influence. 
And there's a, a lot of things we can do. I, I list in the book, Secret History of the American Empire, a whole long list of things we can do. Things most of us already know about, like night, not buying shirts that are made in sweatshops, cutting back on oil production, drinking water like this. <laughs> out of a glass from the tap. Well, you can drink it out of a bottle as long as you fill it at the tap, but, <laughs> you know, it's great. My job, I get to travel around the country tasting people's water, and this, this Miami water is... <laughs> wow, that has a bouquet. <laughs> If you don't like your local water, get it changed or buy a filter or something. <laughs> but don't buy water from Fiji. The, a, a couple of nights ago, I, I think it was when I was in Portland, Oregon, uh, and when I was doing the book signing afterwards, I said something like this, and this young man came up to me and said, thank you so much. He said, I'm from Fiji. <laughs> <laughs> We're an arid country. We don't have much water. It's all here. I have to come here to drink Fiji water. So, there's a lot of things we can do that are listed in the book, but these are band-aids. We need band-aids because we're hemorrhaging badly, but now we've got to go to the deeper root problem. We've got to heal <coughs> the root problem. And um, how do we do that? This root <coughs> problem is really turning these corporations around. We've got to convince the corporations to have as their primary objective creating a sustainable, stable, and peaceful world. And every one of us, you, you have passion and you have talents and you must bring those passions and those talents to bear in your way. Your way may be different from mine. I'm a writer. I have a great passion for writing and I hope I have some talents. But some of you are dentists or lawyers or doctors or musicians or housewives or massage therapists or you're retired or whatever, but you have passion and you have talent and you must bring those to bear in whatever way it best suits you. I was a student for all my life of the American Revolution. I grew up in New Hampshire. I, I come from a long line of New Hampshire and Vermont Yankees. We fought in the Revolution. We fought in every major American war since. And I, a long time ago, was struck by the fact that I was extremely thankful that Tom Paine did not try to lead armies. <laughs> and George Washington did not try to write pamphlets. <laughs> and Benjamin Franklin, who was an old man, probably about my age at that time, didn't try to do either. He went off to France. He was a diplomat, and he convinced the French to join us, to become our allies. Each of these people followed a different path, but it was all headed toward the same destination. And that's where we are today. The destination is a stable, sustainable, and peaceful world. And each of us may take a different path to get there. Take your path, but make it happen. One thing we can all do is support organizations like Rainforest Action Network, Pachamama Alliance, these various organizations, Rainforest Foundation, that do the things that we believe in. If, you've, if you're for animal protection, join an animal protection organization. If you're for women's, right, women's rights. But Get out there, whatever it is, follow your heart, your passion, and join these organizations and know that you can do it. Also, as a kid growing up in New Hampshire, I never realized that African Americans in my country had to ride on the back of the bus in certain states until Rosa Parks taught me that. Who the hell was Rosa Parks? She's you. Every one of you can sit on the front of a bus. It may take some courage, but you can do it. And I had no idea that the DDT we were using to skill, kill mosquitoes in the pond in our backyard was also killing fish and birds until Rachel Carson's wrote Silent Spring. Who was Rachel Carson? She's you. She's me. And I was pushed around a lot in third grade by a big bully. And I go running to the teacher asking for protection. And finally the teacher said to me, kick him in the, he in the shin. <laughs> Some point you gotta fight back, Johnny. Kick him in the shin. And I did. And it worked. And I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't be standing here tonight if it weren't for Mrs. Schneer. <laughs> How many of you have ever heard of Mrs. Schneer? 
<laughs> you have now, and there's one guy who heard of was at another talk of mine, and he heard of her before. So now everybody has heard of Mrs. Schneer. Mrs. Schneer had a huge influence on every one of you because you're here listening to me tonight, and I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Mrs. Schneer. <laughs> so we've all got incredible power, and now we need to get out there and change this world. You and I need to leave this room tonight committed to doing something every single day to turn this around. And I'm going to bring this to a close uh, now, but uh, in closing, I, I would just like to uh, quote Shakespeare. Uh, Shakespeare had some pretty pithy comments throughout his work, but especially in his closing sometimes. And at the end of King Lear, he says, and as I read this, I want you to keep in mind, please, there's sheep in that border collie. <laughs> <laughs> the weight of this sad time we must obey. The weight of this sad time we must obey. Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. And so, think about those sheep in that border collie. It's time for us all to speak what we feel not what we ought to say, and to speak out for a world that our children and our grandchildren will be proud to inherit. As we leave here tonight, let's go out together. Let's welcome this opportunity to hold hands and go out together in unison. We may take different paths, but we're all headed toward that same objective, that same destination of creating a sustainable, stable, and peaceful world, of going out there together to create a world that our children and grandchildren and nephews and nieces will be proud to inherit. And I look forward to going out into that world with you all. Thank you so much.